Yes. So did you state your name and spell your last name? Jason, N-S-H-I-M-Y-E. Okay, and how do you pronounce it? Shimye. Shimye. Yes. It's different from Consolé's last name. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. They're similar, right? Yeah, cross. Yes. What is she? Nishimoy? Nishimoy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's start, but if you can tell me how old you were in uh, 1994. I was 15 years old. So it'd be one five. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so tell me how old you were in 1994, where you were living, and what your living situation was. Um, in 1994, I was 15 years old. I was living in Kibuye with, you know, my parents. We were, you know, average family. And um, I was in school that time, in high school, in second grade. So we were at home for break time. And um, I was with my parents, my friends and siblings. It was as normal as can be. But one day things flipped out and um, genocide started. Okay, before we get to that day, mm-hmm. um, what did you know about the RPA, the RPF, um, in Kibuye as you were growing up, what, what did you know about them and what did it mean to you? They mean a lot. They mean you friends. Say, you say the RPF means? The RPF, um, the way I hear them before 1994, I felt that they were uh, men who commit themselves to rescue or change the Rwanda because the politics was bad. So they, they, they mean savior, friends, brothers, sisters who are very committed and who are deciding to change that the country because it was in bad shape at that time. So I was young but I knew them because I had a family friend and close family members who were in RP at that time. So I knew them really good. Oh, so were these friends or family that grew up in Kabuye? Yes, yes. So what happened? How old were they and what did they do? Um, Most of them, they were in their 20s when they went to RPA. So, and you know, as the situation was getting worse and the discrimination was getting worse and uh, racism and Hutu against Tutsis, many young Tutsis took the initiative to go and um, work together with um, the group which was already made a while ago. And that time it was, it was mixed with people coming from inside and people were already outside and they decide to go and fight for the change. And then what did you, what kind of message was the RPA or the RPF? What, were, what, the, what message were they sending to people in Kabuye like yourself and how did you get the message? What were you listening to? There was um, Muhabura radio that they were using. We had to listen to it. Uh, we didn't have to, but we were happy to listen to that radio a couple of times a week. So, and there was a song for hope, for healing, for unity, and those songs and messages and program they had on, it was really uh, important to me and my family in general and um, the Rwandan in general, because we could see um, that we need um, another, another hearer because we were wounded psychologically and physically in many ways and um, in the normal life, we couldn't go to school, couldn't go to work, and people were discriminated to go even to high school. So the, um, the leadership at uh, that time was horrible. It was just like for one tribe leadership. So um, you would hear songs, would you hear, um, what else would you hear? Speeches and um, messages, and the army, they were having some uh, what we call morale songs. 
So then saying that uh, they're gonna fight and they're gonna win and um, they bring, you know, country together. So it was a big hearing, a good message for me to hear. So did you, could you play this uh, radio, the radio in your house? In yes, normal yes. Or were you afraid and maybe it would get Oh, before? sure. I was afraid <laughs> every time. Before, before you even put it on or turn the radio station on, you had to hide. Or many times for us to hear the station, we had like a group of young people, especially in the older people, we had in the, to go in a special room or go to a hiding place to hear the, the station because if the government knew that or the Hutu neighbors knew that we are listening to that radio, they were uh, treating us as enemy of the country or um, get in trouble for that. So it was very serious if someone is trying to listen to the radio. Some people they might did, but I believe we were in the um, in the situation where you just worry that they can even come in the night and kill you for just listening to RPF uh, radio station, Mohabura. Did this happen when you were in Kuya? Yes. What, what did you hear? What, what what was the story? I um. Personally, didn't see a witness. Um, many people were arrested because of the message or because of listening to that uh, radio station. But every day they were just trying to find a way to get rid of Tutsis and kill them. So, um, and when 1990 happened, and when the RPF invented the country and decided to fight because the negotiation and the peaceful way was not an option anymore. Um, many people were arrested, and uh, it was a combination of, um, you know, you know, the leadership that has created this system that nobody has um, right to listen to RPF uh, radio station, and nobody has uh, right to live with who you are Tutsis. So um, it was a really big mess, but. Yeah, many people were killed and many people were arrested. And my, my village, actually in 1990, we were attacked by Hutu neighbors. And um, they, they cut one neighbor uh, with machete. And um, then we ran away, all of us, and went to the small complex called Mugonero. And then we stayed there for about a couple of days and um, until when the situation was calm, and then we returned back home, but at that time we were scared to death. So what song did you like? Um, there are many. <laughs> there are many. Um, there are many. There is one, say, Tuzarugwana Kandi Turutsinde. So that was very encouraging. Okay, so what is the name of that song? Um, the title, I guess, is Tuzarugwana. So spell that for me. T U Z A R W. No, it's R U R W N A. And is this a military song? Yes. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means we're gonna fight, and you're gonna win. Tuzarugwana kandi turutsinde he 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 ye he 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 tuzarugwana And that would make you feel how would that make you feel I felt like on my 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 um my tribe even if we were in in trouble and if we were in you know in a position where we didn't have voice that someone is deciding to come and rescue because we were discriminated um, and I was worried that um, I can be killed any time, but I knew someone is, is fighting for our human rights and, um, you know, having the same rights as everybody else. Right. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Kabuya, was that in the Zonturquoise? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. So the RPA in the previous battles, they never got close to Kabuye. No. No. They were down the other, they were further right. On the east. east. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, so then now, it's April 7. Um, what happens in, in your village? They, that day I will never forget in my life. That morning, after we ran that, um, President Abjad Mana was, you know, was shut down. And um, the whole country turned upside down. And um, that morning, all Hutu neighbors, they were um, so kind of angry mood. You couldn't tell them hi or say anything. They don't respond to anything even hi or good morning, they couldn't understand, you know, or they were just trying to avoid us. So, and that's after we see they, uh, some houses were already, you know, they are starting burning them down and um, people are running for their life. My family and I and everybody in the village who were Tutsis, we, we ran away so we can survive. So after we left, they started destroying our houses. And um, they killed some people who were left behind. And at uh, that time, we knew things are very more serious than before. So we went to this complex we went to before in 19, 1990, that called Mogonero complex. We stayed there. Sorry. But So the situation got worse. I'm sorry. Could you start again? Because I had to step away. It's okay. We went to, uh, we went, where did you all go? We went to Mugonero Complex. So running for our life, trying to find a way we can be safe. And that was religion, seven at day Adventist Complex. So that's where we used to go before, even if we had. Um, security issues, because we felt like they going to be afraid to kill people in the church, in the hospital, in the school, where we, we were. So, but in a couple of days, we start seeing that, like, the surrounding of the, the complex, uh, they were killing people, you know, every day, and burning and, you know, destroying more houses every second. So... We stayed there, and we were not allowed to go outside of the complex. So the government, the Hutu government that time, um, sorry to say Hutu government because that's what is called, they sent it to police, um, or we called them gendarme that time, to come and um, be in the complex with us. So it was almost like we are here to protect you, but actually it was not the case. So um, about April 16th, um, that's when the whole complex was surrounded by very young with the guns, military, police, you can name them. That morning, they start shooting. I was scared that um, that was going to be my day. About 10,000 people died that morning. So they shoot and throw the grenade in the complex who were so many. Try to resist by throwing the stone, you know, and um, anything we can find. But the grenade and the bullets were just like um, as much as the rain. So um, after I throw a couple stone and find, you know, many people in the front of me are dying like so many every second, um, I, I decided to run away. So um, left many people there, most of them on the ground. And uh, I ran to Bicesera Mountain to see if I can hide in the mountain and in the, in the bushes. But it was a very uh, scary day. And thank God I survived, but innocent. About 10,000 people were killed there. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a very famous incident. It is very sad. Yes. There was a, the, the minister, he was, he was not helpful, right? 
Yeah, I didn't have kill to Yeah. Yes. That was his church, right? Yes. Yeah. I was there. And his son was a doctor, so he was killing his dad and it was horrible. I mean, what were you could you I mean how did you like nothing you had no protection from anybody. No. No protection from the police, no protection from the religious leader, no protection no. from the Burgermeister, uh, or the mayor. Um, I mean how, as that, as those events unfolded, how you must have become very desperate. Yes, um, of course I was, and I still, because um, as a human, especially as American, as I see how human beings should be and the human rights, I never seen any such or never heard that kind of event before. So, if you look on the Rwanda during the genocide, when the whole civilian are trained to kill, and they will report saying that the civilian was trained to kill up to 1,000 people in one minute. Those are the civilian. So military were trained more, and the police were trained much more than that. So, and when the whole country turned to kill this uh, small group of we were the minority at that time. It was really um, no help. Neighbors were pushing us away. Friends, church members, they were going to church in the morning and going to kill in the afternoon. People were, they were getting, uh, they were calling going to work. So like, that's their job. Every single, Person. I remember there was one day we went to hide in my village from Bicesero because it was getting very uh, terrible in Bicesero as well. And uh, one little boy in about seven years old was watching the cows. He found us, me and my two cousins. And he was about to kill us, so we ran away. This little boy, and um, my cousin was in their 20s and 30s. So, and he called for help to come and help him to kill us. Women came, I mean, uh, men, everybody in the village with guns and machete and everything. And um, so, and you can imagine how one little boy like that can kill these grown up three people at the same time. And that's how confident the Hutu were that time. That's how the government has been teaching them that they have the right to kill. And, um, you know, it's, it was really unspeakable, and nobody can find a word to express what was happening that time. Sure. Did you, how, how, much, uh, how many people in your family did you lose at the church? In the church, um, um, including the, fam the extended family, is about 200. So it is a big number, but the survivors now, they are not even, you know, many, because some they were killed along during the following, you know, days. When you ran to the mountains, uh, who was with you? I was with my two cousins, I said that they, we were trying to hide together. So, um, and the other people I didn't know, some I knew their faces and without, you know, I didn't know their names. So, and you know, a little bit here, be there, some um, couple of people, we were just running as a small group. And after we reach a, a long mountain, we sit on the top, just looking back where we came from, it was just a smoke and gun sound and grenades. So we went there and we forget about where we came from because you couldn't even, um, go back and it was it was just a traumatizing event we couldn't imagine how dead bodies are laying on the ground there because we were just nobody they were just on outside so from the mountains you could look down and you could see your church on fire yes yes yeah and it, it was just heartbreaking to know your family members behind burning down. Yeah. Um, was was it the mountains where the people were trying to fight back? Yes, 
it's a it's a Bicesero is a big big um, area. So it is made by different um, small um, mountain, and um, one we were on first was called the Gateway, and then from Gateway because we the following like two days after we were attacked at the Gateway, and um, once we fight and we couldn't fight anymore, so we decide to run to further in the long mountain in Bicesero. And that's where we felt like we don't have anywhere else to go. We have to fight back because there is no um, no other way to go. So were you part of the informal group of people trying to fight back? Yes, I was. How, big, how many people were there? In Bicesero itself, I can imagine it was about 50,000 people, men and women, kids, all, but of course, people who could fight back well, especially the men, um, like people who could run, you know, pick up a stone and throw it away. Um, so it was not many, but we were just trying to protect our men and the women, you know, our um, kids and the women behind us in the on the mountain. So just throwing the you know, the stone and trying to see if they can go back where they can, they, the Hutus can go back where they came from. So you had stones, and what did they have? Machete, grenades, um, all kind of tools. There is a one called in Hamongano, which was a big uh, stick with, you know, the end it was just like bigger. So in the Hamongano, they get them ready a while ago. Uh, basically, when the genocide, you know, when they were trying to prepare genocide, let me say it that way, they buy machete a while before the genocide. They made those in Hamongano a while before genocide. Um, in the school, in eighth grade and sixth grade, there was a program to make in Hamongano for the student. And after we make it, we didn't even know where they are going because the school was shipping them somewhere and we didn't know where it was, but it was something for the genocide. People didn't know they are making. And every time the school um, make them every year, like a hundred of them, they ship them within, you never know where they, they went. So they, they, um, people were involved in preparing the genocide. They were collecting all those in Hamongano so they can distribute to the Hutus when the genocide started. And they come with them and um, they were, you know, using them to kill people. Um, so you were trying to fight back in the mountains. Yes. Um, then what happened? Did you had to leave? Okay. Each day was like every minute, thousands of people were killed because um, the gun, uh, grenades, from the Hutus, they were just throwing them every second and shooting people every second. So what the strategy we used to use, we were on the wrong mountain on the top, and then we waited until, and we, we sit down, or lay down so they don't see our face, so they don't shoot us from far away. So, and as soon as the face of those, um, uh, Hutus get to the face of the face of our group, and then we stand up. And the way the why we did that, because we had small stick and stone and um, and rancid, like uh, to so the strategy we call it mixed, because we felt like once we are body to body or we are mixed, a mix of people running around, or we are not separated, or they are, we are not in the front, they are not in the back. We felt like it was going to be harder for them to shoot. So we were trying to make harder for them to shoot so we can even, you know, throw a stone or just use a stick so uh, the gun don't have the, the, the way they can use it. So. That time, that strategy we call mixed, 
in Kinyarwanda, we call it Kwivanga. We were going forward and you go inside them and the people in the army and the police who were among with them, you know, trying to shoot us. And we feel like if they shoot, they're going to shoot their members. Or if they shoot, they're going to shoot us anyway. So we, we're going to be mixed and then there is no room for gun, you know, shy. Or they can shoot them, you know, their members by accident. So, and that strategy works for a couple of days. Because as soon as we mix with them, and we throw a uh, stone and um, use what we had, then they tend to feel like, oh, we are not here to die. You know, we are here to kill. So they run away. Um, so we did, but May 5th, about uh, in May, it wasn't working. So they came with high train people who are like presidential guard people, high trained um, military, and they shoot us from distance. And they send um, rockets and, you know, and grenades. And everybody who just see 100 people dying every minute. So, and we try to run. And since that time, it was not as resistant as before because we lost so many people that day, and we, we can you know, couldn't fight much anymore. But we were just trying to to resist here and there, but we were break down. Did you get into the mix? Yes, I did. You fought hand to hand. Uh, it's thick, and I had the, what you call ichumu. So, and once they see ichumu, they were scared. But, you know, it was uh, scary because many people died in those fights. Because you can imagine 50,000 people to die uh, in about two months, three months. It's, it was a big loss every day. And um, every time, you know, you are like 100 people in the group and you see you are like five left. So it was very scary. But it was no way, no, nothing else to do. Because what happened in the, in, during the, that genocide, if they caught someone, uh, you know, without fighting or without running away, they were going to torture that person. Or we had to pay to be killed like with a bullet or with a, um, to be killed quick. And that was, you know, was we couldn't do it. First, we didn't have the money to pay to be killed quicker. Second, um, why are we going to make it easier for them anyway? So we know we didn't do nothing wrong to say I'm sorry. Some kids, they did. I'm sorry, I'm not Tutsi. I don't want to be Tutsi. Some, they say, oh, I'm not going to be a Tutsi anymore. It didn't help. So these people didn't have no mercy, no, no, no empathy. Uh, so it was nothing else other than just to run away and if they can't reach me so they can shoot me with a gun other than for me to, to stop and then say, oh, can you shoot me then if I can die quicker without torturing me? Because at the gateway where I say we, 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 we stopped first after we left Mogonero, they were cutting people in pieces from the foot or from the hand up to, to the body so they can die slowly. And sometimes they cut them in pieces and they leave you know, them un, un, unfinished. So they can come and cut more pieces the next day. So that kind of torture, that kind of death, uh, nobody wanted to go through that. So we were just like, let me run away and if they can shoot me and I die, you know, I die. No, you know, I can't do nothing much about it. So it was, it was no, nothing else to do. Yeah. Uh, my next film, by the way. Thank you. It's about mountains. Thank you. <laughs> How did you survive? Uh, about 
um, June, I was so weak. And I ran every day. Sometimes we ran around from morning to night because the Kira's alive like before the sunset around five in the morning and they go home, you know, at the evening around 6 p.m. So, and running around away from them, going around the mountain and going, coming back and trying to see if we can survive each day. So I did several times, I did, you know, until the June and I find myself so weak. And I thought that, you know, if I keep doing that and I, these people who are running behind me are military trained and there's one day they almost caught me. And they say I was with a small group uh, with kids and they say, lay down so we can kill you. And I refuse. And the kids who were behind me, they lay down and they start cutting, you know, their head off. So I refused. So I kept moving. One of the military train, he pointed a gun against me and trying to shoot, but his gun broke. So in that day, I say, um, if I try to run around again, I may be caught and be killed. So I decide to hide. I find a small cave and um, I hide there a couple of days before the sun rise around, you know, four in the morning. And then um, at night when they go and they come out of the cave and go and meet and see who survived that day because it was a very small group. Until when uh, my cousin was shot in the hip and the guy who shot him, they told him that if they were going to caught him, if they were going to caught him, they were going to eat his heart. They were, you know, getting evil that time because they were eating people's flesh. So I, he asked me where I was hiding. So I took him there, but it was a small cave that people can, two people cannot fit. So I took him over there, but I had to find another one for myself because it was getting very dangerous and they, you know, they, the Tutsis were getting a small, you know, it were a small, small number that time. And so uh, I find another cave not far from him. And I was going to hide in there. It was a small uh, hole and the water was going under the, um, the, the ground. So I was going to sit in there and there was a bush on the top of that hole. So I'll go and sit in the water, because the water was passing under, and um, and when the Hutus coming, passing by or searching, I go inside the hall and sit in that small cave. And after they pass, I come out and sit in the bush on the top to be a little bit dry. And once I hear them again, I go inside the cave. And I did it until when um, genocide st uh, stopped. Did the genocide stop where you were? They, about the June, um, the last week of June, the French troops came by and they said, we're coming to save you. Okay, go ahead and come out. So we came out of the hiding place, but the bad thing, they came with the Hutu criminals so they can see where we are hiding. So after we came out, the French troops left. So the Hutus start killing again for that last week. And we run, some people were killed, some people survive. And on June 30th, if I remember exactly the date, they came back. Had so much pressure from the RPF that if they are not able to stop the genocide or bring the survivors who are left from those, uh, Zone to request, the RPF was going to push and come in the zone to request to, to stop the genocide there. So 
that when the French troops um, came and and say, okay, come around here, come together, and then from that day, um, there was no killing in my group. Okay. So let's say that again. <clears throat> the French <coughs> military came back yes. because the RPF said, if you don't start saving some Tutsis, we're going to attack you. They, um, what the French troops was doing in my area, in Bicicero, is bringing people from hiding places. And then so they can give last chance to Hutus to kill whoever is left. And do they did. And they succeed on some level. But since the RPF was almost controlling the whole country except the Zontriquas, and they heard about this um, genocide keep going on in the Tirquas, they, um, to the information I received, they had to um, come and push more. And they did, I guess, in a Yikongoro. They tried to push the French troops so further. Uh, so the RPS force were, was ready to come and fight to stop the genocide in, in the Zone Tirquas as well. But the French troops didn't want them to come there because that the zone the French troops was using to evacuate the criminals to run away from the justice so they can go hide in Congo. So, so what, I'm not clear. So the, what, what made you turn yourself, come out of hiding the second time? <laughs> it, was, it was no, I, I didn't know because when I saw them again coming back, the French, the French troops, and some people already got on the on the on the road because um, you know they came and stopped, and some of my fellow survivors they went to approach them. So I felt like let me go see what they're talking about. So and once I went there, uh, they were just you know saying to stay there around you know where they were, and they start putting the tent in place. So in you know that was the sign for me to stay, but I didn't trust them because the first time they come and left. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, when did you first see the, uh, the RPF? When did they, when were you saved? In um, the days that follow that uh, June 30th, that's when they, um, there were some truck which help us to get to RPA um, in, Gitar in Gitarama. And um, first we spend one night uh, on the way going there and we meet uh, the RPA forces and army forces. So, and that's when I felt like I am surviving because it was a miracle. And um, I couldn't believe that I could survive. Because every second it was, I was, I, it was a death to me. Because if someone was dying every second anyway, and I didn't, I didn't see my, my survival, any anyhow. Because it was no hope. That's what I'm trying to say. But once I, um, I saw the RPF forces, I felt new. I felt like I was my. That one was my second birthday because. Yeah, you know, I I was gonna die anyway, so. So describe that moment for you in a, a French military truck or some other yes. truck. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they were driving uh, to a RPA camp. Yes. So tell me about that moment. That moment was exciting, and I felt like I couldn't believe is is it happening. I thought I was dreaming first, but when I saw the RPA army in my face, when we came out of the truck, um, I was just like, you know, I was dreaming still. I didn't believe that it was going, you know, it was a true. Um, so, but losing many people 
it was still hurting, but I didn't um I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was just confused because of the trauma and the situation I'm coming from. But I I, I just feel like they were my hero looking on them. That's that's how I felt. It was just like unbelievable feelings I cannot explain. Or just like a, a superhero because I couldn't believe they could stop the genocide. Um, compare, you know, when you look on the military numbers, the RPA had the small numbers. The Hutu government has most a million, or the civilian were trained, or military and the police were trained. So when you look on the how many RPA forces well, and how many people were in the army, and how many people were, they were fighting against, it was a miracle to see me, to see them able to stop the genocide. So, because you, it was, um, it was a miracle. So, can you think of a moment that happened with you, your first conversation with an RPA member, or your first interaction? Can you remember a moment from that day? Um, it was a cry. We just look on each other, say, um, I, some, some they ask, where are you coming from? Because, you know, they were just saving everybody. They didn't know who they are saving because it was just um, they were fighting everywhere trying to go and, fight and save more. And every time they see you, they just cry. We were kind of, it was like almost silent emotion time. And um, it, I, the first time I sit with someone, they talk. Okay, so it was like... A, weeks after because they were first they had so much work to do and the country was destroyed and some criminals were still trying to kill more people in further in the villages so the military had so much they couldn't even have a minute they fight at day and night trying to 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 bring peace back so um, but after a while, after we start like feeling this is true, we are surviving, and sit with some army people, I felt like my heart was full of joy. And I, when each time I sit with one of them, I feel like I want to hug them forever. I don't want to, to, to let them go. Because they were just like my hero sav saver. Yeah. Did your um, members of your family or your village who joined the RPA, did you ever see them again? Yes, some I did. Yeah. Yes. Um, what happened to you afterwards? Did you go back to school? Did you join the RPA? What did you do? I, um, after the genocide, I went to live in the orphanage in Gitarama. And um, that time, you know, I find that, you know, it was good to go back to school, you know, trying to get more education. And in the break time, I go back to the orphanage until when I find my mom and my brother. So and then I say, I'm not going to go back to the orphanage, so I'll go to them in the break time. So I went to back to school finish um, the nursing program, then start going to work. And I went to work in my village in the Mogonero Hospital where my family, most of my family members were killed, which was hard to do, but I chose to do it to be able to heal. Yeah. So your cousins who were in the RPA. Yes. You must have told them your story, right? Of course. And they must have told you their stories. Yes. They must have found out that most of their family was gone too. Yes. What was that? How were they? I mean, because they were veterans, but they also couldn't save everybody. How do you think? What, what, how do you think they were feeling? It is it's, it, it never feel any easier than, I mean, to them, up to day, when we talk about how our family were killed in a horrible way. We all cry. 
I don't know when it's gonna get better, but up to today, since then, even today when we are getting together and talk, everybody cry. So, um, because the, 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 the killing is, is not a human, the, how people were killed it is unspeakable. So they, they, they are crying. And sometimes you get to the level like you don't want to hear this painful moment of family friends who went through. Um, so it is pain and crying moment every time we talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jason, we have a little um, math exercise for you. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move the cameras around. Okay. And give you a map. I okay. want you to show me, you know, Kabuye yes. to the Seventh Day Adventist Church yes. to the mountains to get there on. Okay. You can show that to me. Sure. So. Um, I was born and raised in this area, which is called Ngoma, and um, and my village was called Kigarama, and that's when where I was when the genocide started. So and um, when we left home, we went to the church, Mugonero complex which was made with hospital, school, and the church. Um, on the April 16th, after the killing at this complex, um, you know, some of us, we ran this way going to the mountain of Ubisesero, which was around here, but those two distance are walking distance. So, and this is Bicicero, if I um, can say it on the map. So, and that's where I went and spent most of the, my time during the genocide. And when we talk about Bicicero, it's um, made by several mountains. So, we're running from mountain to mountain trying to, to run away from the killers. And on uh, the June 30th, when genocide st uh, stopped, so I was there. Just so it doesn't get too complicated, just go from underneath the word Bessicero, mm -hmm. draw a line to where you saw uh, the first night of the RPA. Okay, so, and um, from here, we went. Um, the road was going through Kibuye, uh, and then we went to meet the RPA, which was around here, close to Gitarama border. Um, so that's where I first met the RPA army, and I, that's where I felt like I survived because I saw them, and I feel like my struggle is over. So. And um, we spent one night there, I believe, if I remember well. And after that, they took us in their car to this location in Gitarama. And that's where I went to orphanage in Gitarama um, at Kabari. Very good. Well yes. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this map, and then we'll make it into a uh, generated image so you start the process and then we make it different and just makes it more personal that you're drawing it that's good yeah mm -hmm. all right Jason thank that's you it. thank you very much thank you sir